What's going on everyone? Welcome to the video. Last night I put out a request for questions on my Instagram and I got tons of questions from you guys. So I'm gonna go for a workout. We're hitting an upper body workout today. I think I'm on week four of my new upper lower program. And I'm gonna go through the Instagram comments, select some questions and see what you guys wanna hear. So I'll check in with you guys over at the gym. Okay, so guys, we just got here at the gym. Got my notebook handy. So what I can do here is actually go back and look at the previous week at what I did on the overhead press. Look at my RPE. So last week I did 145 for four. So this week I'm gonna put 145 on again, do that for four, see how that feels. When you have that data to look back on, it's just so much more helpful in terms of ensuring progression over time. Um, but anyway, I think I'm gonna go ahead, get into this workout, really get in the zone, put in my headphones, and I'm gonna check in with you guys after the workout's over, answer your questions, and we'll overlay uh, the Q&A with some B-roll from the workout. So I'll check in with you guys then. What's going on guys? We just finished up the workout. We're here looking for an optimal Q&A place outside the gym. There's gonna be a little bit of background noise maybe. We're like, there's an airport right over there. Anyway, I'm gonna open up my Instagram, go through some of these comments and do my best to answer them the best I can. First question, in the interview you did with Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, you said that squats are often overrated and you can get most of your quad development or you can get more quad development using the leg press over time than the squats over time. First of all, that's I think a misunderstanding of what Brad and I were saying. Basically, I asked Brad the question, do you think squats deserve to be put on a pedestal? Meaning they're way better than other quad exercises um, in the way that a lot of people do, especially power lifters. And Brad basically said no, and basically said he just doesn't know because we don't really have that study whether or not squats or leg presses would be better over enough time for the quads in particular. With that said, I think that the squat is the superior exercise, all else being equal, because the squat is gonna activate so much more of the spinal erectors, so much more of the core in general. Also, you've got the bar on your back, so your back is gonna be playing a pretty solid stabilizing role. And I think you're just gonna disrupt more muscle tissue in general with the squat than you would with a leg press. But with that said, if you're someone who can't perform the squat because of just the way your skeleton is set up, or if you have a lower back injury and you don't feel like you can do it safely, you can get great results doing the leg press as an alternative. And that was kind of the main point there, not to say that one exercise is better than another because that's almost always context dependent. Now, if you're gonna use the leg press, I would say to combine it with either some kind of hip thrust or like a lower back extension, just so you can get a little bit more lower back and glute activation that you're not gonna get out of a leg press on its own. So hopefully that clarifies that. I'm gonna try to go through these a little bit quicker because last time I gave like really long-winded answers and the video ended up having to be broken up in a bunch of parts. So we're gonna try to go through these quickly. The effects of marijuana and cigarettes with muscle gains. So I'm actually planning to do a video with, in my opinion, one of the fittest guys in Canada. He's an absolute legend in fitness circles. Uh, his name is Kane Sumbat, uh, also known as Timberwolf. And he gets blazed more than anyone I think I've ever seen. And he's in amazing shape. So we're actually gonna go for a workout in Toronto and I'm gonna try to pick his brain on some of this stuff. So you guys can, can stay tuned for that. All right, next question. So this question has to do with uh, women. Should women periodize training and will the results vary due to women having differences in type one and type two muscle fibers? So. I think that the term periodization gets confused a little bit in general. So all that periodization really means is how you organize your training over time and how you vary different variables over time. So pretty much any program that periodically varies over time is gonna be periodized or that's structured and organized over time. I think it's always a good idea to periodize, but I also think that people overcomplicate what that term actually means. So a non-periodized plan would basically be like muscle confusion. You just go in the gym, do whatever machine is in front of you, throw whatever at the wall, see what sticks. That's not periodization. Also, if you just do the exact same thing every day and every week, and you're still, you may still be progressively overloading, but you're not periodically varying anything, that would also be a non-periodized plan. And from the literature we have, it's pretty clear that periodization outperforms non-periodization when it comes to strength. And the jury seems to be still a little bit out when it comes to hypertrophy, but I think that's just because the results haven't shown up yet in the literature. I think that periodized routines are better. Um, so there's not really a sex difference there per se. When it comes to type one and type two muscle fibers, women and men actually have the same fiber type distribution, distribution until they start training. And then women 
start converting more of their type 2 muscle fibers into type 1 muscle fibers. So type 1 muscle fibers are the slow twitch fibers. That means they're very slow to fatigue, so they're better suited for more endurance type activities. Type 2 fibers are the fast twitch fibers. They're better for more explosive bouts. So in theory, you could make the argument that higher reps, since they're more on the strength endurance end of the spectrum, might be better at, at targeting and growing those type 1 fibers, whereas lower reps are going to target more of the type 2 fibers. And so I guess you could make the argument that maybe women should use higher reps than men. I'm not sure if that's really been shown in the literature, even though in my coaching experience, I have found that women are better at tolerating higher reps, especially for the lower body. With that said, I think that men and women can benefit from having most of their work come in the 6 to 12 rep range. I feel like that's the most practical hypertrophy zone. And then you can have, you know, let's say a quarter of your work or maybe even less in the one to six rep range. So let's say pure strength work. And then you could have another quarter of your work coming above 12 reps. So more in that endurance end of the spectrum. Women could probably do more in that endurance end, but they should still have most of their work centered around that six to 12 zone. Another side effect of women having more type one muscle fibers once they start training is that they're able to tolerate more volume because they're more fatigue resistant. So when it comes back to periodization, I think that women can probably get away with having higher volume blocks of training where they might overreach a little bit more and then see more of like, say, a super compensation response than maybe men could because they are able to tolerate more volume better. Um, the research does really seem to support that. Um, but there's so much more to get into there. And women are not just like little men. They are actually physiologically different. So I'll link a couple of really good articles down below if you'd like to read more on that. Next question, is it possible to gain size on your wrist? So this, I think, came because in the photo I posted, it was a selfie and I was kind of like stood like this and I had my wrist down. And my wrists, my wrists are actually pretty thick. I don't know what the measurements are off the top of my head, but there's no way you can change your bone structure. You could technically make your wrist wider if you just gain body fat because your whole every bit of your body will have a little bit more cushioning around it but you don't want to have just like a fat looking form you want to have a lean muscular looking form so unfortunately there's not much you can do about like your ankles knees wrists um, that's your bone structure and you're kind of stuck with that but honestly if you can build up a nice set of forearms and you have a thinner wrist it actually makes the muscle belly kind of swell out more and it gives you an aesthetic appearance so if you do have thin wrists and you want to build up your forearms Watch my forearm science explained video. I go over everything that you should do in terms of volume and exercises and everything in between. So you really want to focus on developing your forearms, but there's not much you can do about the wrist itself. Okay, what is your opinion on lifting three days a week? So you have one heavy session, one light session, and then a medium session. So I think that training three days a week is good for people who are limited on time. Um, I would do either full body three days a week or do full body, upper body, lower body. So you're at least hitting every body part twice a week and maybe three times a week if you do the full body three days a week split. I don't know if I love the idea of splitting out the rep zones so you do lightweight, medium weight, heavyweight. I would rather just see you do a mixture of all three on each of those days and just split out the heavy work according to exercises. So for example, you might do heavy squats on day one. You wouldn't then also want to do heavy deadlifts and then also heavy bench and then also a heavy row because you're kind of just, you're going to fry yourself by the end of the session. I'd rather see you do like heavy squats than do more of say speed deadlifts, do more of a hypertrophy work on the bench press and then maybe hypertrophy work for the other stuff and then on another day do your heavy deadlift and then on another day do your heavy row or something like that i just think you'll maximize your recovery better by splitting it up that way than just doing like all super high rep stuff on one day i don't really see any reason why you'd want to split it out like that but the three day a week split is actually a really solid one would you say that shorter guys like ourselves bracket five five technically five four and a half uh, but I'll, I'll say five five uh, don't have to eat as many calories as taller guys in order to gain weight. It's a good thought. I think that when it comes to basal metabolic rate, taller guys are gonna have faster resting metabolisms just because they have more active body mass. But when it comes to total metabolic rate, I think that a lot of short, small guys can have super fast metabolisms. And that's because um, there are variable components in metabolisms that can differ massively between individuals and the main one is neat so basically how much you move around during the day and fidgeting so for example Rashan who's holding the camera he's like six four six five 
and he diets on, I, th I would say at the same or maybe lower calories than me. And he has like a foot on me. It's not a slight at Rashawn, but it's just the way it is. Like then there are some guys who are my height who can diet on like a thousand calories more than me. And a lot of this is subconsciously regulated in the brain. Unfortunately, there's not much you can do about it, but there's no real hard and fast rules in my experience. It's not like taller guys always have faster metabolism, shorter guys are slower or anything like that. It just seems to be hardwired into your brain and you know there are things you can do to help preserve your metabolism and I did a full interview with an expert on metabolism about that um, but when it comes to like where your body likes to settle in terms of its metabolic rate there doesn't seem to be a lot of correlation between body mass and total metabolic rate uh, in my experience. Oh and a second part of that question is like is it easier for shorter guys to build muscle? And I think I'll cover that in a separate standalone video because that's a question I get asked a lot and I don't think I could do it justice in a Q&A because there's actually a lot of nuance to that. Next question, having optimized nutrition and training, so you're not crash dieting and you're training in a variety of rep ranges, what would be my best tips for attempting body recomposition? Uh, too long didn't read any new tips besides the, one, the ones in my body recomposition science video. So, by recomposition, for beginners, it's actually pretty easy. You just have to progressively overload in the gym and pay attention to your diet, eat enough protein, and you should be able to get body recomposition pretty easily if you're eating at maintenance or in a slight deficit, especially if you have significant fat to lose. As you get more advanced, it actually gets significantly harder to achieve true body recomposition. And so what I would emphasize is really trying to optimize everything. So in your training program, are you tracking your progress in the gym or are you just kind of freestyling it? When it comes to your diet, are you really optimizing your protein intake in the day or are you just kind of winging it, intuitively eating? Are you spacing out your protein appropriately? Or are you just clumping it all in one meal, which I don't think is necessarily the most optimal way to do it? Are you paying attention to your pre and post-workout nutrition? Even though the literature doesn't show a significant effect, I think it still has mechanistic merit, at least potentially. And since there's no downside, why wouldn't you pay attention to what you're eating pre and post-workout? Are you optimizing your sleep? How's your stress levels? There, there's so many facets that can go into achieving recomposition as a more intermediate or advanced trainee. And that's something I'm actually working on, project on. I won't say too much about it now, um, but I'm gonna be producing a lot more content on body recomposition because it's the goal that I have personally. And I think there's a lot of interesting topics to cover around it. So you guys can stay tuned for that. Just sweating here. All right, when it comes to building the most muscle, would you lean more towards a push-pull leg split or an upper lower split? So I don't really have a preference. I think both are very effective. Right now, I'm actually preferring the upper lower split because going upper lower, upper lower, upper lower rest has me in the gym six days a week and it has me hitting every body part three times a week. And I feel like I'm just responding really well to this program right now, whereas the push-pull leg split is only gonna have me hitting each body part twice a week. So if you do the upper lower split as a four day a week split, I think I prefer the push-pull leg split because it just has me in the gym more frequently in general. Um, if you're gonna set it up as a six day upper lower, I really love that split at the moment, but I don't think there's any split that's necessarily way better than others, except for maybe like bro splits are probably worse than everything else. So I think that periodically varying your split makes the most sense. So if you do upper lower split for eight to 12 weeks, you can do push pull legs next, then you can do maybe like a modified bro split, then you can do a full body split. I think switching up your training frequency and all those variables periodically is the best way to make progress over the long term. All right, next question. All right, any advice for those who are trying to gain mass but can't consume a super high caloric surplus? So I got asked this question a lot, basically, I'm a hard gainer, how do I gain mass? I think that people who claim to be hard gainers, I mean, there's no question that some people can put on muscle much more easily than others, but I think that people who claim to be hard gainers the most probably haven't just given it enough time. You basically just need to be patient and realize that it, you know, over enough time, you might actually end up building more muscle than you realize. So you might just be impatient, not actually a hard gainer. But ultimately, ultimately it comes back to caloric surplus plus progressive resistance training. So the caloric surplus part seems to be what most people struggle with. And I think the biggest problem there is people are just trying to eat foods that they're not able to eat enough of. So if you just stick to the stereotypical bodybuilding foods like chicken, rice, broccoli, whatever, it's gonna be really hard to meet your caloric requirement as a person with a thinner frame and a faster metabolism. So you just have to open yourself up to 
non-conventional foods, eat some junk foods, add high calorie foods, including oils to your dishes, eat peanut butter. You can go the weight gainer route if you can get a high quality weight gainer, even though I feel like maxing out your whole food options first is probably the best route. Um, and then also I think that if you're a hard gainer, you should get very analytical with your training. Figure out w exactly what you're doing and then figure out how you need to modify it to make your results better, basically. Um, and a lot of hard gainers just end up spinning their wheels in the gym because they're hopping from program to program or they're taking advice from this guy and that guy and going with it, trying to figure out what works. I would say to really get analytical, figure out what you're doing and adjust and tweak variables one at a time until you figure out what your optimal program is and then just be patient with it over time. I think I'm getting towards the end of it here. I do have a bunch more questions, but I think I'll wrap it up for this one. And maybe in my next q and I'll ask questions here on YouTube just to see if the, the types of questions are different or see what kind of ground I can cover. Last question here, Raptors versus Golden State Warriors, who you got? I would love to see the Toronto Raptors win the championship, um, but I'm just honestly so happy. They actually just won the Eastern Conference Finals last night. I was so stoked to see that. I've been a fan for like as long as I can remember, as long as I've been a fan of basketball. So it's really cool to see them take it this far. I would love to see them win, but I know the Warriors are going to be a really, really tough match. But who knows? I'm super stoked to watch it. So anyway, that's going to wrap up this Q&A, guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you guys all here in the next one.